So, so Dick, uh, I wanted to start with uh, a quote from your hometown newspaper, <laughs> which I found on the interwebs. And it says this, this is again, the Chicago Tribune. Quote, Costello's job is to turn 140 characters emanating from the fingertips of Snooky, Anthony Weiner, and Kim Kardashian, sorry, K Kardashian, and turn it into a money-making machine strong enough to withstand a bubble bursting. How's that going? <laughs> I'm glad they edited out the hyperbole, for starters. It, I think of the sentence you used to add, you used to end with, this task seemingly insurmountable for a man of such limited distinction. Anyway. As I recall, that article, uh, which uh, ran about a week and a half ago, uh, the headline was, Costello leaves Chicago for sunnier Marin. Yes. Uh, and I think they may have been a little angry at you. Well, they asked me why, you know, they, they set up this, this uh, I think they had a thesis for why I left Chicago to be, you know, I, I finally departed for where the, um, the opportunity was greater. But the reality was that uh, my family and I moved out here because the weather was better. And she kept on asking the question, so why did you really move out there? And I kept saying, because the weather's a lot better. <laughs> and then she would ask again five minutes later, hoping that I would say something else, but I never did. Well, that, that By the way, the, the, one of the reasons, that, one of the things that's going on here that people in the audience can't see is we've got like nine microphones on us. <laughs> no, so it's like really, really weighted. Uh, there's a lot of weight going on in here. Yeah, anyway. well, we, have, we have lots of, you know. You're like a robot. Just, just in case of a, of a nuclear attack, we will be able to communicate. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I did want to ask you, since it's, it's been almost exactly, and I think next month, one year since you were officially the CEO of Twitter, yeah. And you're, you, you, as you pointed out, you actually didn't move out here to take a job at Twitter. Right. However, almost instantaneous to your moving out here. Correct. Uh, you got a call from, from Ev Williams. Who was well, I got a like, DM from Ev Williams. Right, not a call. Of course, that would be, that would be so my era. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, a phone call, but uh, you got a DM. I got a DM from Ev, and he was... Um, well, he was getting ready to have uh, his baby, Miles, and he asked if I could come in for a couple weeks and just help out with the company while he was, um, t took a few days that off. That was a hell of a head fake. And, uh, and then we, uh, we <laughs> kept conversing and went back and forth, and I eventually came in as the COO. Well, eventually being two weeks later. <laughs> so now you've been CEO for a year. A year and several days. A year and several days. Not that you're counting. Not that I'm <laughs> counting. So I, I, it wasn't a typical path to CEO of a major, you know, $8 billion valuation on the secondary market kind of company. Yeah. So I have a question for you. This is a serious question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Does it feel like it's your company now? Because there was an awful lot of, I don't know, soap opera stuff going on for a while there with the board and the founders yeah. and the this and the that. And yeah. Is it, is it Dick Costello's company? Well, it doesn't say that when you come in. Um, but <laughs> I think the thing I'd say about that is, you know what it's like to found, found a company and be the CEO of a company you founded, as do I have been founder CEO of a couple companies. And, uh, you know, from day one, you're the, okay, well, it's my company. I started it. I'm the, I'm the founder, and now I'm the CEO of it. This is certainly a case where I feel like I had to earn the... Um, trust and respect of the team. And yeah, so the short answer to your question is yes, I feel like it's a company that uh, the people in the company respect me as the CEO, they trust me as the CEO, they come to me as the CEO instead of saying, well, maybe I'll go ask the CFO uh, if he can tell Dick to do this, or I'll go ask Jack, or I'll call Biz. So yes, in that sense, I feel like um, it's the company that people know that inside, internally that I'm the CEO of now, and they respect and trust me for it. But there's always a little bit of a difference in being a founder CEO and uh, coming in as an external operator and becoming CEO. Right. When you How was that for a serious answer? I, I, I thought that was quite earnest. Serious question. Yeah, yes. that was very good. Um, when By the you, way, I'm staring at these two waters trying to figure out if I'm supposed to drink out of both of them. <laughs> or I, just think, one. I think one of them I've got was, a coffee. I've got coffee, but... All right. 
Go nuts. If you finish one, start the I'm other. not going to touch either one of them because I'll get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> when you came in, Twitter was in a certain spot. And I mean when you came in as a COO. Yeah. Um, where there were a lot of whales um, and a lot of fails. Yeah. Um, what, what was broken that you had to fix and, and why? Yeah, so there was a, a couple specific things that were uh, broken that needed to be fixed. One was we were in a managed services environment um, that only allowed us to scale up to a certain point on homogenous uh, hardware. So we weren't allowed to design our own hardware configurations, have different machines that were running, you know, that were running memcache and different, machine, different machines for front-end servers. We had a homogenous set of hardware uh, with limited ability to expand. So that was one big problem. We had to move into our own data center where we could design our own hardware. And then secondarily, um, we were on a basically a monolithic um, software. The, the Twitter was written as a kind of a monolithic software architecture, not a set of componentized services. Um, so uh, we've completed the move out to our own data centers uh, on our own kinds of hardware configurations, and that's helped tremendously. I think that was probably the thing that helped the most, because now we can scale just by adding, adding more machines. Um, and then the second piece, which we're in the process of wrapping up, uh, for the most part, is getting off this monolith um, and, uh, and being able to deploy a set of services that are completely distinct from each other but work together. So that'll be wrapped up by the end of this year. It was those two things, and it was, uh, you know, an extraordinary engineering challenge trying to do all that while you're growing as fast as we were growing. So that's what I wanted you to do, you know, before I get into asking you any really hard questions, is reel off some stats. You recently... Yeah. You recently uh, published a number of them, but... Yes, I'll us, reel off some stats. Real, you can just tell me when to stop. I'll just start going. Just go, just reel. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, we were at 100 million tweets per day at the beginning of the year. Um, we're now at almost a quarter of a billion tweets per day. Um, to put that really in perspective, it took uh, three years and two months to send the first billion tweets, and again, now we send a billion tweets every four or five days. Um, that's one. Uh, we had, um, we're, we're at a, over 100 million global active users. Um, half of those log in every day now. Um, not only has the global actives number grown tremendously this year, faster than it's uh, ever grown before in terms of percentage growth, but the logins per day has grown tre tremendously. I think it's correct to say that we were about 30% of our active users were, uh, monthly actives were active every day. Uh, at the beginning of the year, and now it's over uh, over 50%. Um, mobile, as you would expect, um, but but bigger than ever. Um, we're growing our mobile users at over 40% quarter on quarter for the last uh, couple quarters. And then with the uh, with the release of iOS 5 uh, last Thursday, um, we've seen our uh, daily signups just via iOS devices go up by more than 3x, um, uh, and again, that was just on the first day. So the iOS integration is going to be absolutely huge for us, and, uh, you know, we looked at the chart after the first day, and uh, we all anticipated that it was going to be big because the integration is so native and feels so frictionless, but I think it's going to be even better than we thought it was. I, I wanted to ask you about the Apple uh, iOS 5 launch. You, you just answered one of my questions. I, my question was, how did it go? And I think your answer was pretty good. Yeah, it went better than we even hoped it would, which is amazing because we had high hopes for it. So, um, but, just, you, know, get, you know, the other thing you get from the iOS integration is you get these emails from people that give you a feeling for uh, the magnitude of the possibilities. You know, and, 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 they're, and they're just anecdotal, but they're things like you get enough of them that, that are of the, of the tone of voice of, I didn't realize how frictionless this would be. I've already tweeted this many photos. And you know, just to relate one of those sounds like, okay, well, so what? But you get enough of them coming in from different corners of the world that you start to realize it's gonna be a big deal. So how do you feel about t tying part of your fortune to the Apple wagon? Well, so those guys are an amazing partner for us. And, I, and I'll say this for a couple reasons. One of them is because 
Um, when those guys think about products and enhancing products, they think about editing them. Um, you know, I've said before on stage when people have asked me about things like uh, how we think of ourselves vis-a-vis -vis Facebook and Google+, I always say um, we're going to offer simplicity in a world of complexity. But what I mean by that is we're trying to edit the product down and simplify it, not just layer things in. And Apple thinks about things the same way. Um, and it's kind of a simple statement, but it's really hard to edit out things. You've got engineers, of course, who want to deliver features. You've got customers who are telling you, if only it had this and this and this, and voicemail, I would use it a lot more. And so the volume that comes in makes you want to add things, and you have to have the, um, uh, you know, the self-control and focus to edit out. And Apple has always been a company that does that. So they're really, in a way, kind of a, a corporate mentor to us. So they're, in, in that respect, they're a great partner for us. Why did they pick you and not Facebook? <laughs> well, you'd have to ask them that. Damn it. <laughs> Let's go back to all those tweets. Yes. 250 million. Almost 250 million. Almost Just 250, 250 million, million or a so a day. Each one of them, not just one data point, but many, many data points, because it's who tweeted it, what their interest graph is, yeah. who they follow, who follows them, what the tweet's about, the keywords in the tweet. There's probably, in the data frame that is the focus of this conference, there's probably, you know, I don't know, 30, 40, 100 different signals emanating yeah. from one single tweet. Yeah. And you have that, so two orders of magnitude times 250 million every day to process and make sense of. Is this the greatest problem slash opportunity that Twitter faces to make sense of that and surface to us that content and surface to marketers the ability to use that content in some way that benefits their ecosystem? Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. So. Uh, what can I tell you about that? So let's see. One of the challenges that the company has always faced, and I've talked about this before as well, and uh, Ev and Biz and Jack talk about it all the time, is that we have to narrow the distance between awareness of Twitter and engagement on Twitter. I think I've said that so many times now, it, it sounds like I'm just regurgitating a stump speech. But the 250 million tweets a day now means that there's enough content flowing into the system constantly that we need to be able to surface that content um, so that people who are coming into the system for the first time can discover what's happening in the world and what's happening in their world. So what are the global, what are the global things that are emerging on the platform and what are the things that are happening near me or related to my interests? The interesting, so People have talked about this forever, and they always say, you know, Twitter has to separate the signal from the noise. Like, uh, the funny thing is when you, you know, just, uh, you know, you'll get these emails from people that'll say, I've got this great idea for Twitter. You need to separate the signal from the noise. And anyway, uh, so. <laughs> I might have sent you a couple yeah, of those. No, so. no, they're usually <laughs> just like that. Um, and then they want to be paid like half of what we make. I didn't ask years. for anything. So no, I'm you didn't. curious, like, you didn't. how's it coming? So it's coming along well. There's a great, there's a great um, an artifact of separating the signal from the noise. Maybe not the right word on the platform, but I'll talk about it. Um, and that is, so we, we ran internally some tests and experiments where we just tried to get the most authoritative tweets on a particular subject and you know, show those in search results. And so when people internally search for things, we would surface these. Here is just the authoritative tweet or two on this subject. And I think it was William Gibson who tweets under the ID Great Dismal yeah. who said something, I'm paraphrasing, something like, the great thing about Twitter is it's the, it's the street. It's the sound of the street. Um, and the thing about just showing the authoritative tweet on a subject is you lost all the, the volume, the roar of the crowd. So just to give you an example, we were doing tests like this back uh, during the World Cup uh, in summer of 2010. And when Brazil scored their first goal in the World Cup on the Twitter that everyone sees, there was this uproar from the Portuguese speakers and Brazil fans around the world. And on our internal search, there was just this you know, FIFA tweet. Right? <laughs> and so it sucked the 
the by removing the volume, it sucked the life out of it, right? So we've got to figure out, and this is what we're working on now and are in the process of starting to unfold to people, we've got to figure out the way to capture all the volume at the same time you separate the signal from the noise. It's an interesting opportunity. Uh, do you think you figured it out? We think we figured it out. The challenge and the thing we'll, I'm sure we'll have to iterate on is the way you show people that in the design, right? Uh, how do you, there are lots of visual ways to show that and highlight that and think about that across different kinds of news, um, whether it's a, a, a global disaster like the, like the earthquake in Japan or something specific, uh, a specifically focused um, local disaster like a fire at 4th and, and Folsom, and to, but we'll figure it out. So when I think about this problem and, and what you have just said, it, it, it strikes me that you're acting like a media company. That, that you're, you, you've got this great discussion going on with mm -hmm. multitudes of voices, yeah. and your job is to try to turn that into a media product that can be consumed contextually by an individual, both the world and their world, as sure. you put it. That sounds like an editor's job, albeit an algorithmically steroidal editor, but still an editor's job. Is that a so, word, or did no, you I made that up. steroidal? I do that quite I was a bit. Feeling a little no one this picks morning. up on it. It never. It's like stop making fetch work. Um, <laughs> that's a reference to Mean Girls. If any of you are out there, um, but I, the products that you have right now, the ad products that you have right yeah. now, promoted suite, promoted tweets, promoted yeah. accounts, uh, and uh, promoted trends, um, are are a, a first start on that. But yeah. how might those evolve if you start to create? what feels like a, a, a sort of richer media experience. Well, they'll, 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 they'll scale out. Um, so I'll say a couple things about that. One, when I think about the, the things that I worry about growing the business, people, people always ask you, what do you worry about when you go to sleep at night? And I always answer, like, well, that's when I'm trying not to worry about things. I try to worry about that stuff in the morning when I'm working so <laughs> I can go to sleep at night. Um, but, um, but anyway, to continue with the cliche. Oh, I got to cross the what keeps you up yeah, at night, what keeps me up at night question off. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Damn. I'll answer it in that, in that cliche, though. The, the thing that keeps me up at night is not the efficacy of our advertising platform. That thing is working better than we could have ever hoped. And I think one of the reasons it's working so well is <clears throat> there are lots of uh, media platforms, digital media platforms, that businesses come to as a function of, of hey, we want to market on this platform, or we want to advertise on this platform, and that advertising gets sold to them. Those companies around the world, was that me? I th no. It sounded like a drum went off. Um, those companies around the world are already on Twitter uh, today. You know, everything from the corner restaurant in Tokyo that takes reservations on Twitter to, you know, walk down Minna Street here on the side street and you'll see the bird and the at username on the, on the little chalkboard outside the coffee shop. So all we've got to do from, a, from a, a business perspective is help these folks amplify the communications they're already having on Twitter. And most of them have come to the platform to, listen, to start by listening to their customers then engaging with conversation with their customers, and now this next step will be an evolution of that and amplify the communications they're having. Will the ads on Twitter change their format? Will we see richer media, more space, more? Well, I think that the right answer to that question is we have all of our advertising products on Twitter, promoted trends, promoted accounts, promoted tweets, are duplicates of things that already existed on the platform. So we will likely not go say, and now we're going to launch a giant movie ad format that takes over the front page. It, the things that we do in Twitter around advertising will be things that users are already engaging with as organic content. So if the follow-on question, if I may interview myself, is then, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Will you start to, you know, sh surface more rich content in the interface, um, and how do you do that in the... You already are world starting world to do characters? that. Yes, the answer is yes, we will start to do that. Therefore, there will be richer ad formats. <laughs> well, we'll see how people interact with the rich content and right. then decide what to do from there. Okay. Got it. I know that now... The, see, the problem with having these uh, frank conversations is that now the headline's going to be 
Tw Costello colon movie ads coming to Twitter, right? That's not what I mean. <laughs> what I mean is we will, we will. Um, you get that Ben uh, Parr out yeah, there. Yeah, Ben Parr. Uh, <laughs> Alexis, we will, wherever you we are. We were having a joke with, uh, we were, Ben and I were joking earlier. Um, we will do things that resonate with users on the platform and offer those capabilities to marketers. We're not gonna go throw something new into the platform that people haven't tried on the platform and don't already enjoy. Got it, okay, good. Now, I've got an, another question for you. I mean, just, just a couple more yeah. here, yeah. There's um, lots of like uh, scribbles, icons, and strange uh, characters on there. I was a copy editor in another life. Um, so, so here, here's my question for you. Uh, a wag once said to me <laughs> that it's getting very British up here. <laughs> I'm going to go all British on all right. you now. Um, Google, in in creating Google Plus, yeah, was clearly aiming. To, to hit Facebook, among other things, but mainly it seemed Facebook was the target. Let's get some social graph in this search-driven company. Um, and Vic Gondotra will be here soon. But last week they announced- Like right after well, this? Like he's actually going to ambush us and then right. chairs will be thrown. All right. Um, but we, last, last, last week, Google announced hashtags and real-time search. Yes. Sounded like a couple, a couple- I couple. Did up you on notice that? that? I noticed yeah. that. Yeah. Which sounded it was pointed out to me. <laughs> so they may have been aiming at Facebook, but are they hitting you? Uh, so let's see. Uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, it's early days. Um, <laughs> is, is I'm such gonna, a I'm bad gonna, answer. I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flesh it out. Give me a second. It's early days. I'm gonna flesh it out. It's, a, it's not a zero sum game. Can I Can't answer for you? <laughs> <laughs> Just for that, I'm drinking out of both of these waters. <laughs> a person can't throw out a topic sentence anymore? Uh, so Bradley Horowitz has made clear, in fact, he said this uh, last week, um, that they're going to compete on features. And as I've said, um, but we're going to complete. We're going to compete on simplicity. Um, in fact, I think Bradley actually said we're going to compete on features, including simplicity, as um, a feature. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's his quote. Someone's going like, "Whoa!" I'm like, "He said it. I didn't say it." Uh, we're just going to compete on simplicity, and so we're going to try to simplify the 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 interaction and simplify the way people use our service. And we want to, look, we have lofty ambitions, right? We want to be part of the fabric of every communication in the world. And we think we can be on two billion devices around the world. And we think we can reach every person on the planet. Um, and we think that the way to do that is to simplify it. Uh, so I think that over time, Google Plus and Facebook will be more and more different uh, from the experience we're trying to pass on to our, our users. Can you by any chance give us a sense of what you mean by different? Yeah, I think of those, um, well, so first of all, those I think will feel more and more, this is going to be like stating the obvious, they will feel more and more like social networks, which <laughs> Facebook is and Google Plus is driving toward with games and so forth. and. We think about social context only in service to delivering the most relevant information to you right now, um, not in service to anything else. So, like, we don't think of it in service to uh, dating, uh, specifically, or um, uh, 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 back and forth social games, specifically. We think about the social context in service to delivering information, not just, you know, an end in and of itself. So, uh, maybe that's. That's the way well, I think what about came, What came to my mind is uh, uh, this conversation we had last week, actually, about uh, the difference, which, which came down to, uh, you said to me, celebrities and, 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 oh, and sports yeah. stars, their managers manage their Facebook presence, but the actual individuals, I think MC Hammer's out here in, in the audience, they control their own yeah, identity I'm glad, on I'm glad, Twitter. I'm glad you brought that up. So, 
I was, I'm and that seems I'm, to be a difference. I'm really generalizing here, and again, someone will say that's not true of this, in this particular case, but one of the things we observe is that for other platforms, uh, I don't think, I, I don't, I wouldn't isolate it to just Facebook, but for other platforms, athletes, uh, musicians, uh, actors, actresses, uh, 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 politicians, have people that, or managers or agents that manage their presence on those platforms, uh, but they don't give their Twitter password to anyone else. They manage it themselves. And I think that that, um, it's an overused word, but that authenticity and that I want to have this relationship with my, with these people and talk to them directly uh, is ultimately going to be, um, you know, is ultimately what makes Twitter Twitter and we have to, we have to wrap our arms around that and not do, th that means um, not doing things like, um, that, that ruin that for, for those people. Right, right. There are lots of things you could imagine that could ruin that. I want to, pivot uh, a little bit to how Twitter is used in, in to affect or amplify uh, social change. It, Twitter's yeah. been a, a, a very important part of it. I, I, I think that there's pro it's probably fair to say that Occupy Wall Street or hashtag OWS yep. would not have scaled to a hundred plus cities in a couple of weeks were it not for the extensive use of, of Twitter, yeah. um, and certainly in Facebook and other, obviously, cell phones, everything else, but it, it strikes me that there's a sort of special place for Twitter. Some of that has to do with the real names debate, with sure. anonymity and the ability to organize under a different handle, sure. and we heard this from Chris Poole earlier today. Sure. Um, Sean Parker alluded to it as well as in terms of one of his... Uh, no doubt. And so, tell me a little bit about how does it feel inside Twitter HQ to be called to the floor of the House of you know, Houses of Parliament because they're concerned that they may be using Twitter in a subversive way, or to be banned from uh, the word Twitter is banned, as I understand it, from French television? That has something to do with like you can't tout one brand unless you tout all its competitors. I just think equally. it's because they're French. I mean. Okay, so there's a bunch. They've of had a couple of revolutions. They don't need another one. I, I mean, but, but let's talk about that. I mean, what, what, yeah. you know, Gosh, is that in the DNA of, 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 the, of your company? Is it in yeah. your sort of founding values? Or is it like, hey, that's being done and, and now we need to organize around that. We need to protect that. Are you as committed to protecting that concept as you are committed to making sure that you protect, for example, the ability that, that you know, well-known public figures can can control their own, uh, their own handle? So the short answer is yes. In fact, one of our core values is uh, respect and defend the user's voice. Um, and as you mentioned, during the Arab Spring, which was technically the winter, but let's not get picky. Uh, <laughs> in Tunisia, one of the guys that was most instrumental in organizing protests um, who is now the um, interior minister of youth and sport in the new Tunisian government, um, his Twitter ID is at Slim404, right? So uh, good for him that it wasn't his uh, real name when he was trying to organize these protests on a, before there ha had had a groundswell behind it. Um, so it is certainly the case that that ability to use a pseudonym um, helps political speech in, in certain cases. I would say that in the case of the, U I have to talk about the UK, um, the ro London riots thing specifically, The Guardian did a, um, um, an analysis of all the tweets that went out uh, uh, during and then uh, in the aftermath of the London riots. And as we would hope, um, the great, the, the majority of the tweets, I think the great majority of the tweets were more about organizing cleanups, organizing riot cleanups, um, tweeting like, hey, I need to get, you know, I need to hop on the, uh, uh, you know, I need to hop on public transportation and get to King's Cross or I'm, I'm, I'm botching my London geography, but you know, I need to hop on the subway and get to this particular stop. Is it safe there or are the looters out? And you know, is it okay? So that was the vast majority of the, of the content. And I get, you know, our message when we, when we have these conversations with um, uh, government officials internally, um, 
we always say, like, look, you have to hope that the majority, since it's, since it's public, I mean, Twitter is a public, a public communication channel for the most part, with the exception of um, protected accounts, you have to hope that the, the majority of the public communications are going to be trying to help matters, not trying to uh, foment violence. So it is absolutely a core, but you a core tenant of the company. And in fact, you know, one of the things our general counsel always says, and he says it proudly, and I agree with him, is um, we're the free speech wing of the free speech party. Right? And, you, <laughs> and then we talk about it that way. Well, so talk let's about talk about it. Because Alex, Alex, your general counsel, will Alex. be here tomorrow interviewing uh, uh, Dr. Andrew. I've Colton. used his, I've given, I've given the crowd his, his he, line. He'll be, he'll be here tomorrow uh, talking about privacy with uh, the FTC and the uh, government of Ontario. I wanted to ask you this question. Um, because I think Twitter has entered the... Are the zeros next to the questions the, the one the I got wrong? The next ones I'm going to do. The ones I got wrong? Uh, this is the, Checks and zeros. Well, the grade comes later. I'm, All right, I yeah. see. Um, but this is important. The, you know, you've, you've, you've entered a small group of companies who yeah. have the, both the power and, and the responsibility uh, to offer data to governments that could get people jailed uh, could ruin their lives, or if you want to look at it the other way, could help the collective good, you know, manage terrorists into a corner or get them out of the picture. Um, there was a very uh, notable case where Google uh, was asked by the Department of Justice for their entire search index so that they could comb through it under U.S. law to identify certain patterns of usage so that they could start to uh, surveil certain individuals and, and then arrest them, and Google refused. Yeah. Um, if the same thing were to happen to you, what would you do? Um, so we've already, uh, we've already proven what our answer would be there. Um, and I think uh, some of the people in the room will remember this. Um, we were um, ordered um, to uh, disclose the... Uh, uh, you know, IP addresses and information that we had about uh, four accounts in the WikiLeaks case. Um, and we went back and argued for the ability under, on our own, of our own accord, argued for the right to inform the owners of those four accounts that this information was being requested uh, so that they could uh, Which fight, fight that request. Which is counter to the Patriot Act. So that they could fight that request. Um, and so we've, we have done that and will continue to do that. I think the, the, the meta comment I would make on that kind of stuff, one of the things that is um, particularly troubling to me in those kinds of cases is that these orders, um, well, heck, I'll just say it. Like these orders are, are secret orders and part of the order is that you can't talk about the order. Exactly. Um, it's like the first rule of Fight Club, but real. Um, <laughs> And so you're in this, like, well, okay. So, you know, we, 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 well, we did what we did. We fought that and provided these users with the um, ability to fight that request, and, and I think a bunch of them are, and that's still in process. Um, and that's the way we'll behave in those kinds of cases when we can. I'm very pleased to hear you say that. Um, not that I have a political point of view on this at all or anything. Um, and, and we are over time, but I, I, I don't know. It seems to be going well. Yeah? All right. Um, so I, I wanted to ask a couple more questions. And we do have folks with microphones that are running around uh, foregoing dessert. Uh, in case anyone has a question, I guess just wave your, wave your arm, and they'll try to find you. And we'll get a couple questions in from the audience. But my last one for you before we There were like eight people who clapped when you said we were going to keep going. I just thought that was... Well, <laughs> I'm not as, as Senator <laughs> Wyden will tell you, when you, when you get eight letters, that's really 800,000. Okay, good. So Thank 799,992 who didn't write but agreed. Um, so, except now they just tweet. And anyways, here's okay. the question for you. Um, we saw earlier today uh, the, the result of the financing frenzy that occurred is occurring in the valley and has it mashes it up against the regulatory realities of, 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 our, of the US government in that Mark Pincus had to bow out uh, because of sensitivities around his uh, quiet period. 
I heard, I heard about that. I was going to bow out from my dinner chair there just to one-up <laughs> him, but <laughs> decided to come up. Uh, that would have, I would have, well, <laughs> we would have figured something out. <laughs> Not. Um, the pressure, Twitter has an eight billion, roughly seven, eight billion dollar secondary market valuation. Let's just right? call it an even eight. Okay. <laughs> an eight billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, do you have any sense of pressure or living up to that? Well, sh uh, well sure, of course. I mean, I, I don't know if you'll remember this, but um, Bill Gurley, I think, was on stage at your Net Returns conference in 2000. <laughs> and it, oh, right? go deep. Going You're deep. You're going deep. Going into the way back. Some of you may not remember, I ran conferences before Web2 Summit, but indeed. And so Bill Gurley said uh, something that he called Gurley's Law, which was about public companies, but it was that eventually, uh, so this is again, in, keep in mind in early 2000, he said, eventually all companies trade at a price to earnings multiple of eight, around 18, right? And so, uh, uh, yeah, you, of course you feel enormous pressure <laughs> to live up to the valuation. You've got a hell of a hill uh, to climb got, there, Dick. You've got girly cloth <laughs> in, your, in, your, in the back of your mind. But at the same time, um, you can't let that be the way you think about the company. And uh, you, have to, you have to pursue uh, the growth of the company the way you think is, is, is best for what you're trying to accomplish long term. So for example, um, it would be very easy for us to start to optimize. I've said this before too. It would be very easy for us to start to optimize for near term revenue. Heck, there are all sorts of pages on Twitter, doc, all sorts of places on Twitter.com we don't put ads. And, We've just decided that that's not the way that will provide a sustainable, scalable business for us, and we're not going to worry about the fact that people scoff at the valuation and say, those, you know, that guy, those guys aren't going to be able to do that. We worry, we, we worry about and we think about and we challenge ourselves with, um, A, growing the business in a way that makes us proud. Like, are we doing something we're proud of or are we doing something we're ashamed of? Um, and then B, growing it in a way that's sustainable and scalable, and I think we're doing both of those things. I, I have m m many more questions, but I want to allow the audience to, to ask a couple of them, if that's possible. I'm having a bit of, oh, here we go. That's Kat over there. Hi, thank you, Dick and John, for it's really been an entertaining uh, dinner session. My question for Dick is, as Twitter's selling, for example, Firehose acts to the tweets and monetizing, basically, this content, will you ever look at a revenue share option with producers? For sure. We will absolutely look at a revenue share option with producers. Uh, and uh, we, will, we will look at also a revenue share option with uh, distributors. But at the same time, what we're not going to do is... Um, you know, what we're not going to do is go down this, like, pay to tweet or um, we're not going to go down that, 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 that path. Um, when we think about revenue share for producers, <clears throat> I think our thoughts are a little more um, uh, nuanced. They're not pay to tweet or if you publish this many tweets, you'll get this much money. They're more around opportunities like, look, if you're uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, if you're this kind of a, a publisher or a company and you've got a profile page where you want to be able to um, leverage other things you're doing in the marketplace, c will we provide you a revenue share opportunity on our profile page? Sure. Will we uh, allow people to do that in such a way that it starts to feel like cluttered and horrible and what's going on and it's lost its essence? No, we won't do that. So we're going to be really thoughtful about that and it'll be, it'll be, I would say it would be a narrow set of publishers that we would do that with. Um, and we think more about um, revenue share and distribution, all the other places in the world you can go see tweets. I think that, that, that runs to the question which a lot of people have, which is where is it safe as a developer to create applications and businesses that are adjacent and leveraging Twitter's platform, but that you aren't going to then annex? Yeah. So there are all sorts, <clears throat> I described this a few months ago and I tried to articulate it uh, clearly. I'll see if I can do it um, in more detail here. Um, we want uh, developers to move up the value chain. And what I mean by that is 
um, starting to provide value-added services on top of the native experience. So, um, for example, <clears throat> things that help companies leverage the platform uh, or help pub publishers is a better word than companies. Things that help publishers leverage the platform. Social flow is a great example. Um, we're not going to go do the kinds of things that Social Flow or Crowd Booster or those kinds of companies are doing. Um, <clears throat> all the various um, CRM companies that Radiant are out Six. there, Radiant Six and uh, and uh, Exact Target with CoTweet. Right. Um, as more companies start to come into Twitter or increase their usage of Twitter, they have more customers communicating with them on Twitter. It starts to get to be harder and harder to manage the communications. We would love to see um, significant investment in that space. And then um, another area is uh, analytics. We're going to provide, and we already do, kind of simple baseline publisher analytics. Uh, but we're not going to go do any of the... Um, financial services industry analytics that companies like Data Miner provide. We're not going to go do the sentiment analysis stuff that all the big brands and the movie studios and everyone uh, pay significant amounts of money for. So there's tons of opportunity in the ecosystem in this value-added services layer above the native experience. Right. We have a question over here. Hi, Dick. Emma Barnett from The Telegraph. Um, I just wondered, two years ago at this very summit, there was a big announcement of Twitter um, integrating with Google Search and you would be able to get yeah. Twitter results in the Google search index, and that's disappeared. So I just yes. wanted to know why it's disappeared and when it's coming back. So um, any time you're in a negotiation with a company or having conversations with them, there are the, you know, <laughs> it's true that the devil is in the details, and there are all sorts of things that both sides are looking for, and there are different kinds of value exchange you're thinking about. And I think the fair way to talk about it is that um, the folks that we're working with there, and we just can't agree on what the appropriate, um, the appropriate value exchange is. And I don't mean that in terms of, of dollars. I mean that in terms of, well, if we do this, will you guys do that? And uh, there are all sorts of details in there that we just couldn't come to, come to grips with. At the same time, um, one of the interesting things about Twitter is there are actually an extraordinary number of, um, I guess it's, it might still be around um, 25, 30%, it used to be 30% uh, over a year ago, I guess, um, of folks in the company who used to work at Google. So we all have an extraordinary number of friendships and relationships there. Um, and, you know, the answer to when, when, will, when will you be able to see that again is, I don't know. Um, you know, we talk to those guys all the time, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, we'll ask Vic about that when he's here, and maybe we can get something done. So I that feel a little bit of responsibility. It happened on this stage, you know, two years ago. That's and right. I remember that. It would be nice to renew it, it well. by Wednesday at the end of the show. We'll try to get a deal cut. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, it looks like we've run a, uh, Do we have one more over here? Oh, I'm sorry. There's a lot of lights over there. Oh, it's Ben. Yeah. Uh, ben Parr, Mashable. Thank you. Very welcome. <laughs> uh, if it's all right with you, I'll ask my, my question, a very quick question from the Twitter followers. Uh, my question is, I was at, um, I'll start very quickly. I was at a wedding, and I, last weekend it was in Des Moines, and I was at it talking about technology. And, um, I heard a lot from a good number of people who are on Facebook, but they're not on Twitter. The issue being, um, issue you probably heard many, many times, that they can't get into it, or that they don't think there's a purpose to it, or they don't have anything to talk about, so they don't feel like it's useful. Uh, I guess the basic question on, and it's the same thing Sean Parker talked about how uh, power users um, are on Twitter and Google Plus and they're not on Facebook. The question is, does Twitter have that uh, same potential for mainstream appeal that Facebook has? Um, and then question from the chat, from at Cheetos from chat, does Dixie look like Cheetos? Um, well, I'll, I, answer I just, the just second, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, the woman who wrote the Chicago Tribune article that you quoted, she, she, so the answer to the second question is no. Let's just, let me just, let's just do that. I don't look like Cheetos. Um, the answer to your first question, I'll go back to my earlier comment about 
narrowing the distance between awareness and engagement on Twitter. There have been a bunch of like, you know, jokey blog posts about the 42 steps to get engaged on Twitter. <laughs> and you know, they're first come to Twitter, you know, then don't, you know, don't have any tweets, so you go away. And then you come back later and write, it's kind of the story of eventually climbing the very steep learning curve and cliff uh, of getting it, and then you're a core user. And we see that in our user statistics, right? A, per a certain percentage of people drop out immediately, and then once people get it, the churn rate for those people is de minimis. So what we've got to do is surface all this great stuff that pours into the platform on a moment-by-moment -moment basis to everybody who's coming to the platform so that they don't have to sign up and then try to find a bunch of accounts to follow. But, oh, William Gibson actually tweets under great dismal, so you got to know, you got to kind of figure that out and follow him. We just have to, you know, put the stepping stones in the river to help the people get, a, get across the river. Um, it's straightforward stuff. It's just something we have to do at scale when you've got all this content pouring in. I think the, <clears throat> the thing that, I'll, the thing that I'll, I'll close with on that specific question is, it's fun to see now, you know, so the answer to the question is, is it something that can be absolutely mainstream is, of course, the answer is yes. It's fun to see now um, people like Albert Brooks who come into the platform. You can see his first couple tweets are, he's got this book coming out, someone told him, you got to be on Twitter, and he comes into Twitter, and then over the course of the next several weeks, he starts having the ex these exchanges with Steve Martin, and then he and Sarah Silverman get into it. And you know, the fact that you start to see that and see him learn to use it the way we all learn to use it, and then use it more and more regularly, we just have to... Um, you know, Jack Dorsey talks about we have to show the users, not tell them. That's what we're working on doing right now. We have to show them, not tell them. Thank you. Well, we're a good 15 over, and I wanted to, oh, oh one more. One more. It's got to be short. Between you and the bar over there. I'll repeat it. You shout it, I'll repeat it. I thought we were going to do the Occupy Wall Street megaphone thing for a sec. Um, so Alex Howard at Digifile on Twitter. Uh, I think I'm coming up on my 49,122nd tweet. Um, <laughs> woo ah, uh, but you know that's that's four years. I can't get back to the old ones. I can't get back to more DMs. When am I going to get access to all that stuff? Ah, good question. <clears throat> you you guys have got 25, 30 percent of Google engineers. They've got a data liberation front. When are we going to get our data back? Yeah, so we have, you had to ask for one more question, didn't you? We had, <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. I get this question, it's not like I didn't, like, wow, I didn't see that coming. I get that question all the time. Um, uh, here, here's the deal. So we have a finite number, as you would expect, of, of search engineers. Um, they, uh, we have to prioritize the work that they do, and we're prioritizing this discovery work right now. Uh, we hear it all the time that people want to be able to access their old tweets, want to be able to access their old DMs. We understand it. We would love to be able to provide that because it's a better user experience. We just have to prioritize the work. We had so much work to do to eradicate this technical debt that we had in the past uh, that I, you know, I could go into uh, enormous uh, volumes of detail on the work that the search team had to do to port the search platform to the new platform that it works on now. Uh, that eliminated all the right, uh, uh, right TPS tweets per second bottlenecks that they had. And they've done that work. Now they're working on this discovery stuff. We want to get to this work. We know it's important to people. I get asked about it all the time. So it's just a matter of priorities, and we have to, we have to get to the point where we've got the resources to do it. So when are you going public? <laughs> you know, I, I'll, well, I'll I just, go ahead need and the take, money. I'll go ahead and take the bait. So we don't need the money. Um, we've, so raised a, we've raised uh, more money than, um, than we were going to ever do for a long, long time. Um, Eight hundred million dollars was the last round. Is that right? We. Uh, it was four hundred of, of yes. The, Twice. Yes. Um, we've got more money than we 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 you know than we we're gonna we're gonna need for a long, long time, and it's gonna allow us to scale the business in the way we want to scale it at the pace we want to scale it, and I don't, you know, we don't want to have to be beholden to like an IPO window, right? You just, people start calling you and they're like, you gotta get out. No, you would have canceled on me date. tonight. 
you got to get out before this date or the window is going to close. Like, well, I don't want, want to have a window. I want to go public when the company's uh, ready and prepared to be a public company and not at the whims of, you know, some, some window. Here, here. With that, I think we should uh, all thank Dick for giving us so much of his time thanks. tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you.